All right, so here's a few news articles as usual. Um, this biggest mystery in quantum mechanics has always been the collapse of the wave function. Uh, there's very strange, mysterious thing, how things are uncertain until you measure them, and suddenly they stop being uncertain. And it never has made any sense, and this sounds like a great idea. This guy um, wants to say that it is not a reserver, it is just a property of quantum systems that after a while they decay into one state or the other, and stop being uncertain just with a certain probability per unit time. And that just means that if you measure them over a period of time, they will eventually collapse. And that makes a whole lot more sense than this crazy thing of there has to be an observer and are cats observers or is it just humans? And is it something magic about humans that always seem pretty messed up about quantum mechanics? So he's trying to develop experiments to test that. Uh, so people, the Iowa caucus results, I think are still not in entirely. And this is because they uh, did not test the app although I got a copy of the app and tested it and I kept it secret for a day, but now it's available to everybody. So I guess there's no point keeping it secret. And um, it seemed to me like the app was very simple and nothing much wrong with it, but I think they just didn't have enough infrastructure to handle it. But they also had a phone call backup where you could call in the results and all those phone lines are busy. And apparently 4chan, the right wing Trump supporting trolls were flooding the phone lines with nuisance calls. So it's not clear if that was enough of an effect to actually make it worse than it was, but anyway, Iowa certainly was an embarrassing mess for the Democrats. And um, this I thought was very interesting. So a bunch of people, the app became public, a bunch of people tested it. And um, Matt Blaze and other people are really election security experts tested it. And I, when I tested it, I said, this app is pretty good. But then these guys say it's terrible. I said, looked into this, what happened? And it is important. When I test apps, I see if they are really, really bad. I only do very simple tests. And I find tests like plain text data transmission and broken HTTPS which means they're in like the bottom 10% of all commercial apps. And it wasn't that bad. However, if you think about it, that's not really good enough for an election. You might very well have a rich nation state attacking it. So you should really consider more exotic attacks. And that's what this guy did. I mean, he said he found a serious flaw and he won't tell you what it was, but it's similar to the one he found five years ago in another app. And that was this one. The um, Five years ago, one of the people that tested it also tested an Australian app. And he said, what's wrong with it? is it's vulnerable to the freak attack, which I don't even test for because, but the freak attack is this one. Um, it means it's using HTTPS and it's validating certificates, but some of the websites it connects to are using weak HTTPS keys because of the US government. The US government export restrictions, which I've run into and I'm running to them constantly now that I'm doing military work, um, there are rules of what you can export. And for many years, the rules were you could only export stuff with weak encryption that the NSA can break. So the result of that was there's a ton of websites that are like legacy collateral damage from that. There are websites set up with those weak certificates that are technically using HTTPS, but in fact, the, the keys are not long enough. So they can be cracked by a determined attacker. And they say it can take $100 of cloud computing services and the CIV algorithm, it's not something my students can do for homework, so I don't even test for things like that, but a nation state could totally do it. And now this, I think, is a variant of the supply chain attack. If you run an app or a website or a program of any kind, it's probably importing libraries, and they're importing other libraries, and even enumerating all the sources of all the data it's using is hard to do. And for a thing like an election app, you would have to be sure that every single source of code is high security, probably in the US, or at least in NATO, uh, protected with modern levels of encryption and all that. And of course, that's almost never true. You just casually use libraries and some of them come from God knows where. And I didn't think of that, but that's a, that's a good, perfectly good test. Um, they also say there's an API key in there, which I didn't notice, but I didn't look for it. Maybe I'll put that in as an extra credit homework for my own 28 class, find the API key in there. I just looked for like a hard-coded password, but I didn't look for an API key. And that's probably not, they said all you have to do is grep through the correct format for an API key and you'll find they put an API key hard coded in the app, which is a, a pretty serious flaw. Anyway, so that's a more good clean fun. Another thing they said is they distributed it with these things, which I did not know about. If you want to distribute an app to people and you don't have time to get it in the store, you can use these things and you can distribute iOS and Android apps without going through the vetting process, which sounds pretty horrible to me. Test flight lets you display, um, one of them, and the other one is Test Ferry, and these things will um, distribute your apps. You, I think you install this app, and then it can install other apps that aren't from the store, even on an iPhone. 
which is pretty interesting. And I'd like to play with that because that sounds like a wide open hole. And um, these guys, I thought it was pretty funny. They have a series of uh, testimonials. And at least earlier today, yeah, one of these is spelled wrong. So that uh, shows how high quality they are. Uh, one of the testimonials has a typo in it, which is not reassuring. But anyway, so uh, they, I've got to look into these services more. These sound like they're wide open doors to put junk on your phone, even your iPhone. So that would be fun. Anyway, um, this is particularly relevant to this class. Uh, there are a lot of different cookies used by websites, and we're gonna play with some of them later. I'll demonstrate some use of cookies on the Hackathon website. Um, and cookies are a really imperfect, clumsy way to try to add a session to HTTPS, which is intrinsically sessionless. And it turns out to be really a problem. And one of the big problems is um, you get a cookie from a third-party website. So if I put a link on my website that loads, say, an image from another website, and then it tries to send, so I'm, you're on my website, which is samscottstead.info, and I put an image that loads from amazon.com. When it loads that image in the request, it will send the amazon.com cookies from your machine up there. So if you happen to be logged into Amazon, like a lot of people are, I could craft a request that would automatically buy something at Amazon. And people do this. And that's cross-site request forgery. You're on my site, and you shouldn't be authorized to do something on Amazon, but I have links to other sites, and everybody does now. Their web page loads from all over the place, just like that app. And should your browser really be sending cookies to other sites based on sessions you made in the past logging into them when you're on my site, and I'm not from that site? That's cross-origin resource sharing. And it's unclear what your browser should do, and they changed their mind, and Chrome has just changed its mind about how it's gonna handle it. So Chrome has now added um, new features to the cookies. Just for Chrome, it's not a standard. I think you determine whether your cookie is gonna be none, lax, or strict. And if it's strict, then it won't send cookies to other sites from your page. And if it's lax, it will have some restrictions, and none would have no restrictions at all. And now they're going to make a default cookie, which is set by a site that doesn't know anything about this, to lax instead of none, which is going to break a bunch of websites. And in fact, people are already saying, I'm a developer, my site quit working, what's going on? And it took me hours, so I'm glad I found this blog that explains it. Um, this is a real mess. All cookie handling has really been a mess all along. It's a source of a lot of vulnerabilities, and it's an essential part of every website too. So it's one of those really painful, clumsy things that we all use that really doesn't work very well. And there's all these clumsy patches and repairs and security features that try to fix the giant security holes and end up making it hard to use as well. So anyway, um, this was pretty amazing. This guy to get a background check for his job. Yeah. Well, just going back to um, the, uh, the voting app. Yeah. Um, is there any indication of um, if it was hacked, how it was used? And was it used to change votes? Uh, there's no, there's was no, there well, there's no the evidence that it was hacked. As far as anybody can tell, it just it couldn't handle the load. And that's the first thing they said is it wasn't hacked. However, to be fair, they probably would never know if it was hacked. I mean, very few people actually have monitoring to know that. And what he said is you could totally have altered the votes because it was loading scripts from unsafe URLs. So that means in principle, you could hijack the connection to that URL and inject unauthorized script onto the page. So in principle, you could do it. In practice, unless you actually take over the server, you could only do it with a man in the middle attack to one precinct. And now they're auditing all the precincts from like paper records or something. So they say that the final vote tally will be high confidence. It's just like, this is why you should have paper ballots. This is what all the election security experts say. They say the internet is in no way secure enough for voting and you should use paper because you have to be able to just count the ballots. And that's the point. And I realized I kind of lived through this. When I audited the app, I said, this app is fine. Then they said, well, the nation's sake could get it. And I said, well, of course, they can get in everything. I didn't even try to go to that level of security. And that's, of course, the point. Even if you get up to the highest level of security of the best app out there, it's still nowhere near strong enough. And you shouldn't be trusting something like voting on this. And surprise me, I thought if you trust it to handle money, you should trust it to handle voting. But the fact is voting is much worse because it's secret. So you don't get a receipt, and, and you can do it with money. With money, you can sue, you have a receipt and all that. Money is reversible, and voting is sort of not. Anyway, it's a very good issue. So anyway, that, the thing I wanted to show you there, this is a background check that got a lot of attention. Um, he had to get a background check for his job, and what these guys did was take a 300-page report of all his tweets and then see how many of them contain dirty words, how many of them appear to be like hostile, and so on, and that's the background check. 
um, which doesn't seem like that's worth much money. And the, uh, anyway, apparently employers are paying for this background tech, which is just a simple keyword search of your Twitter feed, which is pretty ridiculous. Anyway, um, all right, so I'll just mention this in passing. This is something that is relatively new and not in any of my textbooks or classes, but it really should. I'm thinking of adding it in if I can figure it out, is the attack framework. If you look at the reports of modern crimeware attacks from organized crime groups, which is the way you typically do it now, um, they are infecting websites with web shells. Web shells are things you download. Now we're gonna use very simple ones in this class, like just a couple, one line of PHP, but you can also download 100 lines of PHP shells that have all sorts of functions, just give you a menu, and they're a luxurious way to hack somebody. You upload this file, and then you can go to a menu and say, DDoS the server, use the server to attack another one, steal the passwords, add more code, you know, do this and that to it. And so these guys install a web, and here's the MITRE attack, attack framework. They have these code numbers for every kind of thing you do on a server, like hundreds of them. So it's sort of a baffling spreadsheet full of things, but this is the modern way to classify things. So web shell is a well-known attack where they uploaded a file, usually PHP, although it could be something else like ASP, that puts a script on the server that the administrator didn't want there, and now the bad guy has some functions they can execute. Then they brute force attack, which means they try a lot of passwords until they get in. Then they do account discovery, share discovery, password policy, remote system discovery, then the configuration discovery, then Windows administrative shares are used, and so on. They have a long list of all these things you can do, and you can categorize them, and then you can rate your defenses. We cover this and not that one. And with the bad guys, these are called tools, tactics, and procedures. You learn what they do. And this is how you attribute things to advanced resistant threat groups. You find out which nation is doing it and so on by recognizing the tools. So here's just a step of all the things they do. And these people follow a playbook, typically. So anyway, they, it's sort of nice to see they do all these, install these things, and then eventually get a backdoor. And this one's actually targeting your email. Uh, this is quite a lot of modern attacks. A lot of them target the email. So they can then send emails that appear to come from the administrator or the boss and get you to send money and other foolish things. So anyway, this is the attack chain and people do analyze these. And at first I thought this was silly or too complicated and I'm gradually getting used to it. And I'm gonna have to add like the attack framework, the MITRE attack framework to my classes somewhere. Um, I'm not quite sure which class or where because it is sort of daunting, like five pages of Excel spreadsheet with hundreds of terms. But that is how people are analyzing attacks now and therefore analyzing defenses, which of these areas do they cover? Anyway, so we're here in 129S, and we are here gonna talk about mapping the application, and nothing is late yet, but next week, you'll start losing late points if things are not in by then, because technically people could still add until, uh, I think, uh, not today, but recently. Anyway, um, the, all right. So let's, let's talk about so what I'm going to do is I'll talk about chapter four, at least part of it. And then I just want to demonstrate a new, the new project where you fight hackers on, which should hopefully make it more um, clear how these attacks work. So I'm going to put this out of the way and I'd like to launch the, all right, let me see if I can get my computer to cooperate. It won't let me see the bar at the bottom for some reason. Macs are full of this nonsense. All right, this thing is called uh, Impress or something. Well, this is annoying. Um, how do I get this stupid thing? It won't let me, N? N doesn't do anything. Um, when you have something on, you say? No, I'm trying to get the, the applications to pop up and they're not doing it. So I guess I need to go here and open the application. There's supposed to be a bar of applications at the bottom of the desktop and it stopped working. Of course, I upgraded to the latest Mac, so everything's broken. Um, that's why you never wanna upgrade your Mac. All they do is break everything, but I had to. So there is Mac, there's a, a Apple PowerPoint, which I use, Keynote, there, I couldn't remember the name of the thing. Cause I'm used to using the uh, icon at the bottom, but so Keynote should be somewhere. There it is, now my life is good. And for some reason, the bar at the bottom is not working, but this is very common. I have to restart this Mac about every day now because it's, they broke a lot. It, things freeze, the touch bar freezes. Um, you know, this is typical. Whenever you update to the latest Mac OS, a whole bunch of stuff breaks. And I would never have done it, but I needed to do it to uh, compile code for the 
iPhone. So we're here with chapter four. All right. And we'll play with some of these things. All right. So mapping the application is here, and I'm just going to probably make this big so I can point to it. All right. So the point is, the first thing you have to do to test an app is to wander through the app and find all the pages and what it does. And you're looking for the attack surface and the vulnerability. The attack surface is all the ways you can inject data into the app, each one of which might possibly be used to do something bad. So there are spiders that automatically load websites and click all the links. Um, there's quite a few of these out there. And web application spiders are designed to go through applications. And they therefore try to pass forms and login pages and stuff and drop down menus and all these more complicated structures. And as you can imagine, they are fabulously ineffective at this. They really can't find all the things. They really aren't smart enough to fill out a form with reasonable data. And I found this in the context of Android apps to be spectacularly true. Um, the uh, um, Carnegie Mellon's um, government related security group, the name I forget of them, they tested all the Android apps in the world in 2014. And I retested a bunch of them two years later, a bunch of them were vulnerable and they had missed them because you had to have a human clicking the buttons to get to the bad part. And they just had some automated robot that would try to click the button. And it, since it wasn't smart enough to actually use the app, it wasn't able to reach the parts that had the flaw. And that's the same thing happens a lot here. So um, you can use Z attack proxy as one way to do it. Burp has a spider and they will attempt to find all the parts of an app. And so just like any other vulnerability scanner, like the zap bone scanner that I demonstrated last time, you have to use this. It's an important part of an audit, but you have to understand how limited it is. You use the automated scanner because it will go to what it thinks is the whole thing. And you probably won't. And it'll find things based on some robotic list of vulnerabilities. And you might not think of some of them. And then you have to do manual testing too. So you have the human try to apply intelligence to the parts that look interesting, and you have the robot dumbly try everything it can, and you combine the two to get a more complete audit. Uh, there's robots.txt is a common place to look. Uh, this has been around forever. This is a list of all the things you do not want Google or other search engines indexing, but there's no enforcement of making them actually um, not index this, and not all search engines in principle honor it, and also, if you look here, this probably tells you where the bad guy should look. This is apparently where the secrets are. You can just look there. So it is kind of a crazy idea to have a list of places not to go. And there is, in fact, no restriction on going in there, which is why this is there. Another similar relation, uh, situation is when you come from the Google bot, the Google bot has a distinctive um, refer, or distinctive uh, user agent. And a lot of pages, in order to get cheap advertising, they show all sorts of good stuff to Google. But when you try to see it, they want you to pay. Google will punish you if they catch you doing this, but a lot of sites do it. And so you'll search for something, find all these results, and when you click on them, you have to have to log in or pay to get in there. And so what you can do is you can just install a user agent switcher and change yourself to the Google bot, and then you'll see it the way Google does. And often you'll see more of the page by doing that. Um, they often show a different page to the search engines than they show to the customers for various reasons. Anyway, so that's automatic spidering will, of course, fail to go through dynamically created JavaScript menus, things where you have to log in first, things where you have to pass a CAPTCHA or fill in a form with like a valid social security number or something. All these things, uh, things inside Flash and Java, there's all kinds of things that the automated spider can't pass through that humans pass through. So you have to be aware of that. Um, validation checks, like making sure that the uh, phone number looks like a phone number and so on. Typically, your automated spider isn't smart enough to fill in with valid data. It just tries to put random data in everything. And um, spiders fetch each URL once, which means there might be a page that has dynamically created content. So you go to the same URL under a different condition and there's different content there. And the spider will say, I already have this page and not look again. And what's worse, there are pages that have something like a timestamp in the URL parameter. So it looks like a different URL when it's the same page over and over, or the spider will just keep fetching copy after copy after copy of that page, thinking it's a different page when it isn't. Both of those things go wrong. Anyway, um, that's this one. All right, so it may freeze up your spider. And in authentication, your spider has to have valid credentials, and some of them will let you input credentials for it to log in anyway. And that's fun, but then it can do all these authenticated tasks that you might not want it doing. So here's another fun thing. Your spider will click every link. So it's gonna click links like delete user, shut down database, restart server, delete website. All those links, if it gets to the admin panel, it will click every link and you won't be glad you did that. Your customer won't thank you. 
for running your automated bot trash the website. So, you know, this is a thing to be aware of. And they do, some of them have, don't click something that says like delete or anything, and that will try to help. But you just have to be aware of the limitations of using an automated tool on a live website. It's a whole lot safer to use like a virtual machine copy of the website to test. And generally doing any kind of live testing on a company website in use handling production data is a pretty wild, dangerous thing to do. You really ought to at least wait till the weekend when they're shut and they have a backup or something like that. Anyway, um, more controlled is user-directed spidering, where you go through Burp and you manually log in and explore the site and Burp is just recording everything you do. So you just have a record and you can go back and investigate it later. That's a, uh, a mixture of the two techniques that is a pretty good uh, solution. All right, so my hackathon gets hacked, of course, like crazy. A lot of students are all so here. Everybody really changed these things to these things, which I understand are strawberry cores, whatever those are. They changed all the pictures to that. And uh, they filled it with spam links, just like total spam links. But you know, all these things will totally happen. Hackers on, it's vulnerable. Anyway, and so, um, all right, so if you don't log into Hackers on and you put a couple of things in the shopping cart, then you will find um, in the cart, user only has five URLs, which I would, here, here's user. You only have a few things because I haven't logged in yet. And if you then log in, and do a login event with a name and password, then after that, you'll have more objects in the user container. These new objects will appear, and that's the issue. You'll get different results if you spider without logging in than if you spider with logging in, of course. And that's a thing to be aware of. So I'm gonna bring up the Kahoot, which is chapter four, um, which is here. And whoops, here, let's see if this thing's gonna let me in or what. Right, uh, well, hmm. Uh, well, I know why, I'm going through Burp. Let me quit going through Burp. It shouldn't be bothering you with this nonsense. Um, let me, I have this thing going through Burp for a project, so let me get rid of Burp for now, all right. And now, if I just make a new field, it should go home and it should log in without bothering me about nonsense. Uh -huh. Crap. Um, oh, I deleted all the cookies for a project. Um, all right, I'm gonna have to stop the share for a minute. Um, all right, and I'm gonna have quite a job logging in here because I have two-factor authentication. And, uh, okay. And I'm a high target for hacking, so I have a ridiculous uh, long password. So theoretically, I can open the Gmail app on the phone. And is it you trying to sign in? Yes. Aha, good. So theoretically, that should do it. I wondered when I nuked all the cookies if something bad would happen, and of course this is what happened. But anyway, good. I appear to have made it back into Kahoot. All right. Did you want to try to hack anything your attention? Uh, well, I gave talks. No, I, there was a, a bunch of like trollish security experts that wanted to put me out of the business for teaching CSSP classes. They decided I was a bad guy, and they wrote angry blogs about me. And they seem to have finally given up. But for a long time, there were there were a bunch of angry uh, actual security professionals. There's a lot of gray hat security professionals who are like, they have a real job, but then they do a lot of trolling and attacking people by night. And a couple of gangs of them are after me, trying to drive me out of the business. Because they like to do that. They pick somebody and then try to drive them out. So the favorites are here. And this is 129S, chapter three. Right, I have everything except the one I need. Um, Yep, so let's go here. I see it. My, uh, that's life. My S. All right. Chapter 3A is what I would like, and I believe it does exist. There it is. Okay, good. Don't you want 4A? I think I do want 4A, as a matter of fact. You're right. Thank you for telling me. This is Chapter 4. Good point. All right. Let's go find Chapter 4A. Good. There's 4B. 
Oh, that's the wrong clash. All right. One tw I, it's not listening to me. All right, let's go back to here. Mike Ooch. Yeah, but that's a different class. It, it, it forgot my search engine somehow, my search string. All right. More messed up than usual here. There's 4B. And there's 4A. All right, let's start with that. While I'm here, let's just try to favorite all the ones I can find. Okay, there's three of them. That's probably enough for tonight. Okay. I thought I had already favorited them, but I got distracted writing a project. And this randomization was also in a cookie and it got turned off. Okay. I think we're back on track here. Let's see what happens. Okay. All right. And it is 2-6-2020. Good. Convict Mr. Trump. Well, we're past that, I think. <laughs> Although people are saying, maybe they'll impeach him again. And I said, boy, I really, <laughs> I really don't think so. But technically they could, but in practice, I don't know. Man. <laughs> Seems like there can't be much appetite for that. <laughs> it does seem like he's going to get reelected again. The Democrats seem to be just falling over their own feet and not being a, uh, and he's more popular than ever. So it seems like all the worst, <laughs> this is what Pelosi said. She said, don't do it. Nothing good will come of this. And that appears to be true. Anyway. Uh, oh, so Bill, I wait a few more seconds. People are still coming in. The darkest what? Oh, I don't think it's the darkest timeline at all. Ronald Reagan was much worse. Ronald Reagan actually conspired with foreign nationals to hurt Americans to rig the election. I mean, that's why what Trump did was really just sort of for show. Previous presidents have done really bad stuff, much worse. Anyway, um, they just didn't get caught. nobody ever impeached Reagan. Reagan, everybody loved Reagan. He could just do anything. He had a grandfatherly friendliness, so it was okay when he just did awful stuff. Anyway, um, so how to use BERT to examine HTTPS requests. Talk about this. Okay, right, you have to add the certificate to tell the browser to trust BERT as if it was a real CA. All right. What tool will find every page in a web app? Or at least try to find every page. Yeah, that's a spider. Now a scraper will try to take the data off the page. To find things like email addresses to send spam to or something. Anyway, all right. And what part of a website typically has validation? Okay, forms, that's the point. And all right. Which website feature is not a problem for a spider? That's the point. It can handle many pages, probably better than a human, which is what it's good for. These other things, it's not much good for. All right, what bird feature stops all internet traffic? Should be used to this for now. The first thing you have to adjust every time you start burp is turn off the stupid intercept. I don't know why it blocks by default. I almost never want that. So the first thing I always have to do is turn off the stupid intercept. All right. 
And what risk is there if you spider while logged in as administrator? All right, and of course, you may do awful things like delete the website. So, Dave, that looks like a real name. Peter, that's a real name for sure. And uh, it looks like I hit the sound button. Killed the glorious sound, but anyway, that'll do, Gary Lynn. There are lots of buttons for me to hit by accident on this Mac, in addition to there being defects, but such is life. I still like my Mac anyway, but Windows machines annoy me a lot more. So you have to put up with quite a bit of irritation to use computer devices. All right. So like a user-directed spidering would probably be better. The human is smart enough to navigate through and um, not do stupid things like delete the website. You can use Chrome's developer tool to see the requests and responses in the browser. And then you don't even need a proxy and you don't need to install the certificate, even if it's HTTPS. One good thing about it is it shows the time, which is what it's designed for. So if you load a web page and open Chrome Developer Tools, it'll show you each component loading and have a little bar here that shows you how much time it took. And because you often want to find out why is my website so slow, and it's because of one thing, like a Twitter widget or something is really slow, and uh, moving that on the page or changing its priority or taking it off would improve your website. So this is often a performance issue. But anyway, you can see everything there, every request and response in here. You do not need BERT just to view them. You can even edit them to some extent in Chrome Developer Tools. I haven't played with that much. All right, and so here you can get various charts that show how long different parts are taking, which parts are fast, which parts are slow. Um, all right, but there's often hidden content on websites for a lot of reasons. People often leave old pages up and forget to take them down, old versions. People often put things on there that are secret and they don't actually secure them with uh, privileges. Instead, they just think you won't find it unless you go through the login page. That's called insecure direct object access. It's a very common situation. But lots of reasons why you might find something up there um, that they didn't want you to see, like backups and such. Um, so many, many things are up there. Um, old demo files that were installed with the web server and so on. Uh, configuration files, especially these modern JavaScript-based frameworks like React and Node.js have config files, and that's what some of the modern web hacking is. It's beyond what's in your book, is how to find the config files for that stuff and mess with them. Um, and I don't have any projects about that yet, but I'd like to add them. I'm just not that good at it myself yet. But there are these modern complex frameworks are loading these libraries in everywhere, like that guy with the voting app said, and those libraries are coming in securely, and they're putting config files up there, and people often forget to secure that stuff. So you can go in the config file and find out things you shouldn't know and mess with the settings. Uh, you might find comments in the source code, you might find log files, and we'll show you how to find some of them later. Uh, then there's lots of brute force techniques. Um, people often leave pages up, but there isn't a link to the page, so your spider won't find it, but you just try common names, auth and login and forgot password and so on, and there are a bunch of automated tools that just have a list of thousands of common names for files, and they will just try to find them all. Um, Burp has a brute forcer, that will just try a whole lot of names, but they deliberately crippled it to be really slow to punish you for using the free version. If you pay for it, it will get up to many requests per second. You can just write your own Python. Here's a simple Python script. It's easy enough to do. This will just send a request and connect, and then it will just take a whole word list and try all responses, and it'll run as fast as your web can serve them up. So you can easily just write your own Python if you're not afraid of doing a little scripting, and then you don't need to pay for the advanced BERT features, but BERT builds it all in a tool and makes it convenient. Um, so here's what that brute force did. It found, these are the images had a 301. It tried a whole bunch of, of these directories, HC password now 403. So you see the various results. It found contact, it found search, and so on. Yeah. Do you customize your word list or? You I just use the standard one, yeah. But what I really mostly do is I use tools. Like, um, there's a couple coming up in the next section. There are tools in Kali that do this. Uh, Derby was the first one. Derby and Durbuster are the nicest. Zap will do it too. There are tools that have their own word list of common web names. One thing I used to like using is Skipfish, which was Google's phone scanner, but it seems to be gone. But it was really good at finding everything. So of course, that's what Google designed it for, was finding all the pages. Um, and I, you can probably still run it even though it's old versions, but um, it doesn't seem to have been maintained in a while. 
Anyway, now I've got 4B. I don't need this anymore. So I can get to 4B. And it's remembered, oh good, so. All right, looks like we're in business here. Should have a there. Okay, good. Uh, did he? Bernie said he was going to win Iowa, or else Pete's going to win. It was too close to call before. Uh, oh, there were two ways to count who won, so they can both argue about it. Yes. That's right. Anyway, it's kind of nonsense Democrats do. They make something without one way to win. Come on, guys. <laughs> like, if you play football, you don't have an argument about, well, they might have won by these rules, but they all, the other guy would have won by those rules. Kind of nonsense, anyway. All right, I've got a few more seconds. All right. All right, which standard came from ISACA? Hmm. Is this the wrong class? It seems like the wrong class. Well, it is the wrong class. That's why nothing makes any damn sense. 129S, 4B, oh, this one. I must have been 125. Yeah. Let's try this one, see if it looks more reasonable. <laughs> that didn't seem like the right stuff at all. Oh, I'm having bad luck with my cahoots tonight. But I do have a new project which you'll have fun with after this. All right, good. At least everybody's ready to join in. What's that? Yeah, yeah. I guess it was 18. Good. I'm glad you remember. I'll wait a few more seconds and see if we can get back to 18. We may have had a couple people give up and go to sleep already. Maybe not. Mr. Mayhem. I'll give it a few more seconds. All right, let's see if these look like more, more like my questions. There we are. How do you see HTTPS as easily as HTTP? That's Chrome Developer Tools. All right. Which tool shows the timing of the page's component flow? All right. Same thing. All right. How do you find all the hidden content? None of these techniques will work. The only thing that might work is to exploit the server and get root on the server and then look at every file. But I mean, none of these, all these will find some of the content, but there's no way to be sure you've got it all. What tool is ineffective in its free version? All right, that's the brute forcer. Good. 
All right. That seems more like it was from the right class. So. Steve Hahn, okay. All right. And Gary Lynn has won twice. Bob Kaufman, okay. All right, good. So we can carry on to another section here and maybe I'll be able to keep my stuff working better. All right, so uh, you can try to find um, the content that you can see and try to deduce the rest. So all subdirectories of auth start with a capital letter and one of them is forgot password. So you might try all these variations of it once you have a clue. Um, one person I tested their website and they had like login two. So I said, well, what's login one? And login one was the beta test that had like an obvious name and password. And then I got in and they said, how did you do that? I said, well, <laughs> well, you know, <laughs> it's often that way. So anyway, um, so names often have numbers or dates. Uh, you, you just look at the HTML. You have comments may include names, SQL query strings, and Java applets, and ActiveX. If anybody's still using that stuff, they may contain sensitive data just like the API key in the Android app. Um, temporary files are often created by tools. DX stores a directory file automatically created by Max. Um, so you might find that lying around. Uh, there will be files created by Microsoft Office or temp files and many other tools do it. So you know there are often these extra files created by accident by your tools and they might not notice and they might just be sitting there for you to look at. Um, so Burp will try common lists of names and try to dynamically generate stuff based on the names it finds and extrapolate them and so on. Burp Pro has all, we'll try all these mutating things and do all this. Um, the free tools, Derby and Durbuster will do it from Kali also to some extent. But I think all they do is the first one, where it uses a common list of names. It isn't smart enough to try to take the, to high hunt the source code and look for clues. Um, Skipfish, like I say, I think this thing is bloody awesome, but it's pretty much out of date. This thing is really fast at finding things. Um, Durbuster is an option. I think it's built into ZI Track Proxy. Kali includes this thing called Derby, and it will try a whole bunch of websites. I found this to be very useful when attacking web apps. Derby will often find interesting folders and stuff. I've, I've made it one of my uh, first go-tos when I'm attacking a web app is to run Derby. Because I got so tired of I would struggle for hours, then I'd read the solution, and they say, well, there was this password just sitting there in a file, and I feel like an idiot. I said, you know, I should start with Spider. <laughs> There's often something awesome just right there. <laughs> uh, all right. Uh, you can also go on the web, of course. Search engines, the Wayback Machine, forums like Stack Exchange. I once found a uh, website in Texas that was printing checks for a hospital in Canada, and everything was just wide open, going right past. You could even modify the checks as they were getting printed with no login at all. And I couldn't find, it took me a while, I, from the abbreviations on the check, I figured out what company it was. And I found the bank in Canada. I contacted them. And then when I searched, I even found the forum posts from three years before of the web developer saying, I can't figure out how to put a password on this thing. Does anybody know how? And they never did find out how. And they just ran it with no password for years, printing checks in Texas. So it's often people publish things on these technical forums and they put their real company email address and their real name and the name of the product and everything in there without realizing that stuff is public. This is a common illusion of the internet. People think they're in a little cub culture and all the other people don't know. They think the cops aren't looking. They think their parents aren't looking. They think it's okay to chat about these things that they really are kind of private and it's all archived forever. So anyway, a Google advanced search is very useful and we'll play with this a bit. You can look for site, just limits your search to one site. You can have in URL, um, and to look for those phrases in the URL, there's a bunch of these cool modifiers, and we'll play with this in a few minutes. Um, all right, and uh, Nikto and Wikto, our Vuln scanners have been around for a long time. Nikto is the old one for Linux, and Wikto is the Windows version, and these just try like 20 or 30 common vulnerabilities. So they're really fast, not very deep, but you can run this, and if you run it on the Hackathon, it'll tell you a few things. The protection header is not defined and server leaks, I know by e tags. These things all seem to pretty, pretty unimportant. You always see those, but sometimes it'll find something exciting and it's fast and easy. I think Zap is more deep and takes longer, like 10 minutes on a fast connection, as you saw if you've done the project there. Anyway, then the problem is, of course, functional paths because of this craziness. I mean, the official way to do something like this is the URL should be here, bank.jsp, and then all the parameters should be down here, server equals transfer fund, method equals confirm, and so on. That's the 
most logical way to transmit parameters, but a bunch of people put them elsewhere in the URL just to give you a headache. So you might have a login, a home, then transfer funds, then enter amount, then confirm transfer. So there'll be a path through the app. And um, you can try adding parameters. There's often like admin equals yes, debug equals yes, things like that that will have unusual uh, consequences. People often have test parameters that are just easily added. Um, sometimes you can just see it says admin equals no in the request. You say, well, that's just asking for it. Change that to admin equals yes and see what happens. Uh, so you find the functionality of, and peripheral behavior is often where the goodies are. Often the main app part of the app that people use all the time, like where customers buy stuff, they actually fix that. But there's something off to the side, like the password reset that's almost never used. This happened to all the cloud services about four years ago. All the, the main cloud um, virtualization platform was Kimu, I think, and, or something like that. And it had a floppy on every machine that people had forgotten about. And that floppy code was like 15 years old and had like a buffer overflow and you could totally take over everything. And nobody was using it but it was in every machine by default. And that's what you want. Some little thing on the side that people have forgotten about is often where the vulnerabilities are. All right, but then the core stuff is how, when they log in, how do they maintain the session? When you access resources, how do they check to make sure you're really the right person and so on. But those are often registration, password change, account recovery. Those are your high risk items that are often done incorrectly. And if they are, of course, then you can get in other people's accounts or elevate to administrator and so on. Um, any place it takes user supplied input as part of the attack service in the URL, the query sting, the post data, the cookies, the user agent, everything that came from you could in principle have special characters, code injection, and so on. Um, all the forms and everything else that's used to input data from the user, all those are part of the attack service. Uh, then you consider the server side technology. They'll have a lot of different servers talking to each other. Um, interaction with databases and email and other back-end systems, uh, all those are areas to attack. And that's why this class can get kind of daunting. In principle, there are like hundreds of different kinds of attacks for different kinds of servers, and it's pretty hard to know them all, which is why you always want to use an automated Vuln scanner as part of your test because you don't know everything. And the Vuln scanner will do an equally sloppy job of testing for everything. So it will at least, to some extent, try to test those technologies that you're not an expert in. Um, so. Every URL string, all the parameters, these are the places you can put in, everything in the post request, every cookie, every other header, user agent, refer, accept, all these headers can in principle have special characters, uh, script in them, and so on. And then you got these restful URLs. So you have shop, browse, electronics, iPhone, and the last couple of those, electronics and iPhone, are not actually folder names, they're parameters stuck in this restful type URL. So they're part of the attack surface as well. And um, so in the simplest case, you have google.com, q equals duck, but you could put it all these weird ways. You could have multiple uh, parameters separated by semicolons and stuff. You could put them in directories. You could put them uh, with dots separating them when they're actually parameters. You know, you could have encoded strings to put it all in one data, which these are the URL encoded for like equals and quotes and stuff separating them. It's, all these weird formats could be the way parameters go in. Yeah. And those all work? They will work on different servers. Okay. Your server will look for the parameters coming in however they come in. It could be JSON or anything, and you have to feed it the right stuff, JSON, XML, any of these goofy formats. That's the problem. You could write a server that accepts the data in this weird format, and then if your scanner doesn't know it, it won't find anything. So. Um, the user agent is there to detect small screens. Most sites have a mobile version and a desktop version. And the mobile version, of course, might have a vulnerability. The desktop version doesn't. So you might want to try them both and so on. Um, if you're behind a load balancer, it will often have special headers to indicate which load balancer you hit and then which server behind it you hit. Um, and you can often tell this. If you do multiple requests of a, of a cluster behind a load balancer, you get different answers. Um, and so you can tell there's really several servers behind there. And this request went to this one, and that request went to that one. Um, then there are all kinds of out-of-band channels, email, publishing content from web dev. There are other ways data is going into the server beyond just what you see in the web page. Uh, you might have an intrusion detection system that's sniffing traffic. This is why you should never use Wireshark as an IDS, if you, because Wireshark is very vulnerable. 
because Wireshark is intended to make it easy to read network packets and it has all these decoders that decode everything and those are just contributed by the community and not audited anywhere. So a bunch of those decoders have code injection and other flaws in them. So if you run Wireshark, it's pretty easy to send in packets that will take over your Wireshark. And so anyway, there's uh, one thing you can do is cause errors and then things will go into the error log and you can get those to leak out information and sometimes even give you code injection. So there's just lots of other things feeding into those servers and any one of them is part of the attack surface. What's that? Is wiser to use burp instead of sharp? Oh, oh yeah, burp is not a scanner. Okay. Burp is just an attack tool. If you want to have an IDS, you use a real IDS. Get a hardware one. And if you want to sniff traffic, you use command line tools um, like um, TCP dump. Okay. That just log into your file. That that's you don't use Wireshark. Wireshark also will just fill the random clash. Wireshark is never intended to really sniff live data. It's not secure enough. What you're supposed to do is save a PCAP and then analyze it later with Wireshark. That's what it's really good for. And that's important though. Yeah, good. All right. So let's take a look at the right class, 129S for C. Aha, this looks like it might be the right one. All right. I give it five more seconds. Looks like that's it. Okay. So the volume scanner that runs on Windows. Wicto, that's it, good. Which header might expose private data from one website to another? Pretty rude. Prefer, which by the way is spelled wrong but it's in the official RFCs and you must always spell it wrong or it's incorrect. So this is one of the many irritating things about the web. And a referrer sends the URL you came from and that could have parameters in it, like cookies or even passwords or credit card numbers or something. It's kind of rude. Um, which tool came from Google? That was Skiptish was the Google tool. It's still, I don't think it's been updated in a while. Maybe I should take it out of here. Anyway, which system might put data sniffed from a network package into a web app? All right, and that's your intrusion detection system. And so let me record these winners. And then I think we'll take a 10 minute break and I'll do the demos. So I have Elam3 and Ken10 and Leviathan. I get that's Ed, isn't it? That's probably what this chat message is going to tell me. That's what I thought. It's Ed. Okay. <laughs> All right. Good. So I've saved these. So let's pick up at five after seven. I'll take a 10 minute break and then I'm just gonna do demos. We didn't quite finish this chapter, but I think that's enough of the textbook. More of this will put people to sleep. Um, so I'm gonna stop the recording and I'll resume in 10 minutes.